Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Addiction Recovery Channel. I'm Ed Baker, and I am your host producer. Uh, I couldn't be happier today. I'm actually very thrilled today to have as our guest, uh, Sam Kinones. Thank you, Sam. Great to be with you, Ed. Thanks very much for having me on. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I know your schedule is a little bit tight, to put it mildly. Um, Sam, yeah, Sam Quinones is a Los Angeles-based freelance journalist. He's been a reporter for over 35 years. He's the author of four acclaimed books on narrative nonfiction. And I've read, I've had the good fortune of reading two of his books, and I cannot, uh, I can't even recommend them too highly for anyone who's interested in what's happening in America today, specifically with regard to overdose death. Uh, first, we have Dreamland. Dreamland, uh, the true tale of America's opioid epidemic, was published in 2015. Dreamland ignited awareness of the epidemic that has cost the United States hundreds of thousands of lives and become the deadliest drug scourge in our nation's history. And I might add, in my state's history in Vermont. Dreamland won a National Book Critics Award for the best nonfiction book of, 19, of, of 2015. In 2019, Dreamland was selected as one of the 10 best true crime books of all time. Congratulations, Sam. Thank you. Sam's latest book released in November, 2021 is The Least of Us, True Tales of America and Hope in the Time of Fentanyl and Meth. And we'll go into this a little bit later, Hope in the time of fentanyl and meth. The Least of Us was nominated for a National Book Critics Circle Award for Best Nonfiction Book of 2021. Sam, I can't even congratulate you enough. I'm, I'm just, uh, you know, just, it, it's beautiful what you've done. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Ed. It's very nice for you to say that. I appreciate it. You know, I just like to, um, I like to set the stage for the, the show today. Uh, for the audience. Um, what we'll be focused on today is what Dan Ciccaroni, Dan Ciccaroni is a researcher at the University of California, San Francisco. He's called what we're, what we're in the midst of today, a syndemic, a synergistic quadruple wave, uh, a vortex of overdose death, almost unspeakable. It's almost impossible uh, to describe. Basically, there are four uh, hurricane force winds feeding into the storm. Um, a, 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 in, in a confluence uh, today that Sam is going to go into. Uh, the prescription of pharmaceutical opioids, heroin, fentanyl, and what we call MOS or methamphetamine and other stimulants. So Sam, I'd like to, I know we can't really separate these four things out, you know, really separate them because they're, they're combined, but let's try to take them one at a time for the, sure. for the viewers' um, comfort. So first, uh, prescription and pharmaceutical opioids. Let's let's begin with that. Yeah, well, I, th I think that began because, well, several factors in it, in my opinion. Uh, one was that a pain specialist began to think, hey, we do a poor job of treating pain, which we did. Some of them began to fasten on the idea that we should be making greater use of opioid painkillers. Uh, morphine, but then also the branded ones at the time, it was Percocet, Lortab, uh, Vicodin, et cetera, uh, hydrocodone, oxycodone uh, pills, branded pills. Um, they were joined by the pharmaceutical industry who made those pills to push this idea. Um, they began, I think part of it began really because they began to make kind of in their messianic fervor to deal with a very real problem, which was under treatment and poor treatment of pain, mm -hmm. they began to make unfounded claims for what was possible using these drugs. These drugs have been used in medicine, but in very, very tight circumstances, very scrutinized and so on. And they were pushing for a much more liberal use of these drugs all across medicine. Uh, and into dentistry too, you know, um, uh, removal of the wisdom teeth and so on. Yeah. They began to make the claim that these pills were now, science now knew that they were virtually non-addictive when used to treat pain. That was not true. Science did not know that, but it was pushed as kind of this idea. Uh, pain became the fifth vital sign. Pain's not really a vital sign at all. A vital sign is something you can measure to see if you're alive, like a pulse. 
But now they were proposing a vital sign that, that what they really wanted to do was reduce to zero. You know, if you'd reduce your pulse to zero, you're dead, right? Well, pain was so pain was kind of confusing to a lot of doctors, but there was a, a lot of economic pressures on doctors. They wanted to kind of get rid of their pain patients. Their pain patients took up lots of time. They had managed care now. So those two, you know, a pa one patient would be 12, 13 minutes of time. And that was about all a lot of doctors had. So you began to see this movement towards this. I think a very important part of this, I have to say, is that is us, American health consumers wanting to be cured, wanting a quick fix. We go to the doctor who we don't know, increasingly you don't know, it's an urgent care doc or something, a managed care doc, you don't really know who they are too much, it's not like the family doc used to have. And, 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 and the idea was, doc, I don't wanna be told what I need to do, what I need to do to take accountability, responsibility for my own wellness, eat better, drink better, get more exercise, don't smoke, don't, you know, get lose weight, et cetera, all these, we push back against that. And so you began to see this real move and increasingly beginning in 1996, when Oxycontin comes out, yeah. you begin to see this in, enormous increase over many, many years of uh, prescriptions of opioid painkillers nationwide. It's a national thing because it's doctors all across the country mm -hmm. who are pressured or and get into this really reluctantly or many who embraced it uh, eagerly. It, it takes all kinds, of course. Talk, talk a little bit about that. Talk a little bit about the pressure on the medical profession, namely the sure. family, Purdue Pharmaceuticals, and how that, that whole opportunistic greed uh, really began to influence this process. Well, what I think began to happen was this coincided mm -hmm. very uh, directly with an expansion, really what I call a sales force arms race mm. in the pharmaceutical industry, where you get more and more and more people being hired as drug uh, reps, drug sales reps. Now, it used to be drug sales reps were men. They were usually doctors or ex-doctors, ex-pharmacists. So they knew a lot about what they were selling. They weren't really good at selling it. In fact, they didn't view their job as hard sell at all. They're, they view their job long term because they were usually from the communities where they lived, where they where they worked. They didn't want to ruin uh, relationships. And so there was a, a very responsible kind of check and balance on what they did. Well, that began to change in the mid 90s and really was off the rails within a few years. You began to see, I think we had 38,000 sales reps in 1995, drug sales reps, 2002. I think the number was 102,000. So it just exploded. It was a lot of people hired who didn't know anything about pharmacy or, or medicine. They didn't know what they were selling, but they did know how to sell it, you know? And so you begin to see this and, and leading the pack in all this, or really kind of setting the stage for all this was Purdue Pharma, which sold Oxycontin. It was their lone drug. They were not the biggest company, mm -hmm. nor did they have the most sales reps. But they employed these very, very aggressive sales tactics in the pursuit of selling one drug, a narcotic, and selling it as if it was almost like an over-the-counter medicine, right? Well, they, Highly addictive and badgering doctors. The highest bonuses ever paid in the pharmaceutical industry were paid to per Purdue Pharma reps during these during these years, uh, increasingly. And you began to see them uh, particularly focusing on doctors in areas where doctors were already prescribing a lot of all kinds of different pills, right? It wasn't just uh, narcotics. They thought if, if you attack those doctors, you go after those doctors aggressively, they will go along. And then, then the, and that proved to be true. And of course, once you get people on these pills, it's very hard to get them off. They're highly addictive, unlike what they proclaim the science to be. So you get by the late 90s and certainly into the 2000s, this, this um, massive kind of force, a juggernaut of, of pressures on doctors, pressures from Americans, uh, pharmaceutical companies pressuring with their sales reps, selling um, a very aggressive use of a highly addictive substance claiming that it was virtually non-addictive when used to treat pain. And that was really what caused the first phase. And that led to then the second phase, which was, which was uh, heroin. All of this was kind of the story that I was trying to tell in, in, in Dreamland.
And you you tell it you tell it beautifully in Dreamland, and you also tell it beautifully in in The Least of Us. And one of the things that uh, I, I think is very clear is your research into um, you know documents from uh, Purdue Pharmaceutical that they they were aware that the higher the dose, the more frequent the dose is taken, the more likely the person is to develop addiction, and the more likely the person is to be like a customer for life. They, they knew, they knew the basic truths. They knew the basic truths that every drug dealer on the street knows. Talk about, right. what was that, ABC? Their ABC? Policy? Yeah, always be, always be closing. Now, that's a, that's a, um, a phrase taken from a very, very great movie called, called Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. Oh, yeah. Starring yeah. Al Pacino, Ed Harris, Alec Baldwin, I just, uh, you know, Kevin Spacey. Fantastic about a bunch of kind of down on their luck real estate salesmen. And uh, I heartily uh, endorse, uh, recommend that movie. You should watch it if you haven't seen it. But but the 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 the, the phrase that they're always drummed in and strong drummed in their minds is always be closing. Well, as um, um, as uh, more and more attorneys general began to subpoena records from these major companies, particularly uh, uh, after about 2000, well, I think after Dreamland came out really is when it began to happen mostly, you be, they began to find little jottings at conferences by Purdue reps, you know, always be closing like that several times the Tennessee, the Tennessee folks, um, uh, the attorney general's office investigators found this uh, frequently that at, 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 at sales meetings, they were told to kind of push, always be closing, always be pushing the doctor to push clients, the patients up to a higher dose. The higher the dose, the more chance those patients are going to be using that narcotic, Oxycontin in this case, a year to five years down, down, down the road. And so this was all part of this very aggressive marketing that lasted for many years and and really pushed um, these pills out into the pop uh, the, 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 the the population and began then to create un, unlike what they claimed began to create a subset of all those users it's it's true it's really ought to be noticed you know uh, opioids did a lot of good for some people it did a lot of bad for some people as well. And there was a collateral damage that was most likely unnecessary had they just really been more muted in how they pr pushed these drugs, how they sold these drugs. But as they did, they created a subset of people nationwide. Again, uh, a, a lot of people new to drugs or a lot of people certainly new to dr opiate addiction who now formed a new market. And when they did that, increasingly the Mexican trafficking world began to take a, uh, sit up and take notice. I write about the first crew, the first crew of heroin traffickers out of Mexico who really understood what was going on when it came to pill uh, prescribing. Guys from a little town in a state called Nayarit in on the Pacific coast of Mexico. And these guys are not the only drug heroin traffickers out of Mexico. The reason I wrote about them is because they had this unbeatable system, retail system of selling heroin retail by, by the 10th of a gram, very much like pizza delivery. So they, in every town they would, they landed, they would have an operator standing by to take the order. Addicts would call in, the operator would dispatch a driver, you know, and, and it was very much like pizza delivery, except for it was heroin. And they understood this. And the reason they were so important to this story was because they landed in Columbus, Ohio, one of them actually, but then later all of them, landed in Columbus, Ohio, just as OxyContin was taken off and becoming this major force in creating high levels of addiction and, and people, couldn't, that couldn't, people couldn't afford. They were looking around for something else, some substitute, and along comes very cheap, very potent black tar heroin sold by these guys from this little town in Mexico. So the story in Dreamland is really about how they were the first ones to recognize and then systematically exploit the coming market for heroin, that massive widespread uh, uh, prescribing of opioid painkillers implied. They saw that first. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, and they were like the pioneers in many of these markets in Cincinnati and in Charlotte and in Indianapolis, Columbus, of course, et cetera. I actually, I mean, I, I actually 
experienced that and saw that happen. I was a, a clinician in uh, Lamoille County where, where Daniel Franklin is from right now. And um, there, was, there was no heroin really in Vermont to speak of, uh, not in my practice anyway. But, but around 2009, 10, 11, 12, we began seeing people with opioid addiction, mostly guys who um, worked in trades where pain was part of the trade. Yeah. So construction, um, farming, yeah. um, uh, you know, in the woods, uh, you know, uh, landscaping, things of that nature. And they would, they would get, there was a lot of pain pills available illicitly on the street. They weren't prescribed pills. They would buy pills on the street because someone told them, hey, you know, this will work for you. And it worked. What happened around, in my, in my experience anyway, I think is what you're describing. Around 2013, somewhere around there, 2014, I began to see people in my practice who had been introduced to opioid painkillers illicitly because they had real pain and it worked for them. And then one day they went to their connection and their connection said, you know what? I don't have any uh, Oxycontin, but what I do have is some heroin and it works. Yeah. And they would begin by maybe snorting heroin and six, seven months later, because it's more efficient, they'd be injecting heroin. And then there was the beginning, this is when Governor Shumlin in Vermont dedicated his whole state of the state address to what heroin was. I remember that. Vermont. Yeah, I think that's exactly what you're describing was that. that and, that and that story Ed, is the story that really took place all across the country. Yeah, because yeah. again, for your, for your viewers don't know, I mean, these opioid painkillers are opiates, mm -hmm. right? They are chemical cousins, all derived eventually from the opium poppy, all chemical cousins to heroin. They create the same euphoria when used, uh, abused. They also create the same withdrawals when you don't have it, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, that story that you describe happened, I mean, I think it began to happen first right off the bat. As soon as, you know, as soon as this really got going and prescribing really took off, I would say by 2000, by 1998, nine. I began, I found people who were already switching to heroin. Mm -hmm. Then of course it accelerated and accelerated and, and even much more and, and began to spread all across the country. So hence you have an enormous new heroin market created on the basis of the overprescribing of these pills, pain pills for all manner of things. That was a crazy thing too, you know? I met, I can't tell you how many people I've met who got addicted or whose kids got addicted when they were given uh, uh, opiates for um, a wisdom tooth extraction, carpal yeah. tunnel syndrome. Yeah. I met a woman the other day who, who said her addiction began when a doctor prescribed uh, Oxycontin or hydrocodone, I guess it was, for, for a foot rash. It became, see, that's what happened for a lot of doctors it became kind of like the go-to medicine. Yeah, you know, just do it for everything. Well, no matter your problem, here you go. Here's some opioids. And that, that, that is where, you know, these pills are fantastic pills when used in the proper, proper way. The problem is when they, when they break through those boundaries and are, begin to be used for all manner of things, then you begin to have real serious problems of the country, which is, which is the basis of all that we're facing today. Yes, because they not only work on, on uh, physical pain, tissue damage, uh, bone damage, uh, inflammation, they also work on emotional pain, you know, uh, post-traumatic stress, adverse childhood experiences, right. depression, anxiety, things of that nature, and the, the ubiquitousness of them. I think that's the thing that beautifully in your book, how we kind of became inundated thousands and thousands millions and millions of prescriptions unnecessary prescriptions yeah you know some, you know and written by doctors by the way who you know were criminal in pill mills you could get thousands and thousands uh, of opioids <clears throat> yeah you know Ed, um i i really changed my feelings on on drug issues uh doing this book and then the least of us initially you know i'd lived in mexico and in mexico the idea is well these drug problems all are because of dr demand for drugs. Mm. And you know, I don't believe that anymore. Um, I believe that demand and supply have a kind of a synergistic kind of uh, uh, relationship, but that it begins with supply. Yeah, It begins with supply. The more supply, the more chance for damage. And that is, we did not have this opioid problem 
to the degree that we had it by 2000, say, or 2005 then, or then 2010, we would never have had it had it not been for the, 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 the supplies that you are describing all across this country endlessly and easy to get from doctors in white coats and, you know, clinics with uh, fluorescent lights, not on the street, you know. And so it was the supply that starts it. And then the supply and demand kind of had this kind of mutually nourishing kind of uh, relationship. But but to me, it starts with supply. I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And the, the, the fellow, the um, addiction scientist, uh, uh, Dan Ciccaroni, I, I cited a little bit earlier, he cites something called supply shock, where usually demand determines supply, but with supply shock, supply determines demand. And it looks like that's what you're describing first with yes. opioids, then with heroin. And now I'd like to and I, I'd like to move into the next the next part because sure. it's so important and it's such a great example of supply determining demand. Um, you say it in your book. I actually had a nightmare um, about it. You say the drugs came fanged now. And you're describing fentanyl. And right. fentanyl is the, the, the prime example of, and I know you go into a little bit of neuroscience in your book too, which is beautiful. I like it. In the least of us. In the least of us. Yeah. Not in, yeah. Not in dreamland so much, but in the least, least of us. Of yeah. The drugs came fanged now. Talk a little bit about that. If well, you start well with, maybe start with Toluca and then move, move into what happened a little bit later. As, as the heroin world in Mexico was providing heroin to the United States, all these drug trafficking groups that were very sophisticated by them um, in the mid 2000s, the Sinaloa, elements of the Sinaloa drug cartel discover fentanyl. So up to now, they're making heroin, they're growing poppies. That's what they know. They're, the drug trafficking world in Mexico has always been based in the land. It's always been ranchers and farmers. But now this is like another generation, right? And they, they find this out from a, uh, an underground chemist whom they hire right out of prison from here. Now, he's a Mexican guy, grew up here in the United States. Learned to, learned to cook fentanyl at some point. No one's, I'm not quite sure how. Went to prison for it. Learned how to cook fentanyl better in prison. Gets mm -hmm. out, gets deported. And then when he gets deported 2004 or 5, he's contacted by these guys from Sinaloa. Hey, we want you to hire you. We will start an enormous new lab, all this top, top glassware and equipment, et cetera. But we want you to make ephedrine. Ephedrine is the main precursor in one method of making methamphetamine. That was their big drug. That had kind of taught them already that it's a better idea to make your own drugs rather than grow them. Yeah. And he, but he goes, he thinks to himself, these guys don't know what I know. I'm smarter than them. He doesn't make ephedrine, he makes fentanyl. They find out, they get a little mad. Not a good idea to make the Sinaloa drug cartel mad, but he sits them down and goes, no, look, you don't understand. I'm going to explain something to you. What I have made for you is the most potent and the most profitable drug in the history of drug trafficking. It's called fentanyl. They set this guy, they had set this guy up in a lab in a town called Toluca, and it's outside Mexico City, a very industrial uh, town. Uh, he fit right in. They, they made him look like kind of a, just a general drug distributor of a chemical distributor, you know. And, and meanwhile, he's making fentanyl. He sits him down and goes, this is synthetic heroin. Okay. And, and the lights begin to go on because they're used to, okay, now we, we're making synthetic, something might, you might call synthetic cocaine, like methamphetamine. We can make it on our own. We don't need any plants or sunlight or anything like that. Now they've got fentanyl. They've got fentanyl to replace heroin. No more land. We don't need land. We don't need sunshine. We don't need uh, farmers. We just make and the lights begin to go on. What's more, he tells them, and they don't believe this at first, but it's true. He says, "This drug, this kilo that I just made." He made a few kilos. He goes, "This kilo I just made will take a fifty to one cut." Yeah, unbelievable. Now, never on the streets do you ever 
here of a drug that can be cut 50 times, meaning you can cut a f- one kilo into 50 kilos and it'll still be able to be sold on the street. It'll be total junk, except for in this case, he was right. Hmm. And so they learn from him. Now he gets busted and, um, and eventually, and so they lose their connection, but they never forget about fentanyl. And then several years later, the Chinese chemical companies begin sending fentanyl largely to folks here in the United States who are thinking that they can make a ton of money on it. And it begins to emerge. And then the, the trafficking world in Mexico gets in on it as well and begins to make it themselves, find other chemists that'll teach them. But the point I was trying to make that you're asking about is that this drug changes everything. It's the most deadly drug on the street. Now, it's say medically, it's a fantastic drug. I've had fentanyl. Many, many, many people have been given fentanyl. They may not even know it when they're after surgery or during surgery or what have you. It revolutionized surgery because it's a quick in, quick out anesthetic. Mm -hmm. So you take it, you're anesthetized for a bit, and then they remove it, and boom, you're back, you're lucid. You're not dopey. It's a magnificent drug when used medically. When it when, and, and it's able to do that because it's so potent and it's got that quick in, quick out uh, method. It's a disaster, of course. It's been proven to be a disaster when, when used uh, by the under, underworld. But that, the point of fentanyl that I was trying to make with what you're asking is that there's the drugs on the street, methamphetamine and now fentanyl are all synthetic. They're made without any plants in labs. They're made in quantities that simply we have never ever seen on the streets of America in our history. And they're, they're, they're cheaper than ever, and they are more unforgiving. As I say, fanged, they don't come with any forgiveness. Mm. You use a little bit of fentanyl, a minute amount of fentanyl, and it'll kill you. Mm-hmm. you know? And so, and, the, and it's that supply issue again, where I'm, I, I wanted to talk about too, when I said that, it's like, it's everywhere so you can't avoid it it's in everything now and that's because it's synthetic and can be made all year round you don't need land you don't need farmers all you need is shipping ports which is what they control down in mexico to get access to the world chemical markets and that's what we're seeing now on the street but it has its roots in the opioid crisis and the heroin traffickers of mexico trying to find ways of providing uh, a, a dope to the united states it's it's almost it's almost like a, a sinister metamorphosis with one level building on the prior level in a way that just contributes to, you know, just death in America. I wanna I wanna make a point and then I want you to go on. This is a, a quote, Sam, from the Drug Enforcement Administration's drug threat assessment of 2015. Okay. They say, quote, fentanyl and its analogs are responsible for more than 700 deaths across the United States between 2013 and 2014. Then they go on to say it's going to remain a threat, but it's probably not going to become a big threat because users are not going to like the way it feels. So 2015, 700 deaths in 2013 and 2014. My, you know, I follow this. So in 2021, there were over 100,000 deaths by overdose in America. 68,000 deaths are attributable to fentanyl. Yeah. So from 700 to 68,000. Yeah. I want, you to, I want you to focus on that because you do eloquently yeah. in, in The Least of Us. How how did I think you say users turned kingpins? Well, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Ed. What the DEA said was true, mm-hmm. that users don't really like fentanyl for a couple of reasons. Number one, the high is not as, as rich, I guess, and it lasts much shorter period of time. That in and out that I was talking about is real for addicts as well, meaning you have to use more often. You're always kind of facing the prospect of drug withdrawals, the withdrawal sickness. Mm-hmm. But but again, that's my point. They supply it with the idea they'll use it. And that's what ended up happening. People began getting addicted to it. And when they began getting addicted to it, they didn't have any choice whether they liked it or not. That was what was for sale. Heroin is now, fentanyl has kind of 
crowded out heroin pretty much nationwide. I mean, I think a couple more years, we won't see anything testing positive for real legitimate heroin at all because it doesn't give you the same protection from the dope sickness that fentanyl does if you're addicted to fentanyl. You cannot have this kind of level of, of opioid if you're up here with your tolerance. And so that was a perfect example of how the supply creates a demand that didn't exist. Nobody wanted hair, fentanyl. Right. Fentanyl kills you. It lasts a short period of time. You got to shoot up all day long. I spoke with a woman yesterday, uh, a few days ago in eastern Tennessee who said, with heroin, I shot up twice a day. I used two grams a day. And and it was fine. With fentanyl, I'm using five, four, five grams a day, and I have to shoot up four or five times a day as well. It's so it makes your life um, a, a much more difficult. Plus, every time you shoot up, you're taking your life in your hands because you're relying on a, somebody to mix it properly, and you don't know that that's true, of course, at all. And that's why so many people are 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 dying of it. So yes, but those those figures you just um a site yeah which while the dea was right about it people, addicts don't really like fentanyl but it's the supply that creates the demand you are going to be given this then you're going to get addicted and then we are not going to sell you anything but because from a dealer's perspective it's much better that if someone buy five grams a day from me than two grams of heroin you know yeah. it's just more profitable all yeah. the way all yeah. the way all the way around and so that is and all those deaths are a direct result of that massive supply hitting people who do not have the tolerance for whatever mix they happen to encounter as they bought it on the street could Smoking be that they have very high tolerance but there's going to be a mix that's higher than their tolerance and they'll die oh, could be oh. they have no tolerance at all they'll they'll buy it the same and 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 die that's what's been happening tell, tell us about the magic uh, bullet uh, phenomenon i was i was uh, really shocked by that i didn't really know that well early on early on in the life of fentanyl in the illicit fentanyl in the united states uh the traffic the, the comp chemical companies from mexico from i'm sorry china would be sending over you know they they people would order it in like a pound at a time or a, a half kilo you know that kind of thing and it comes through the mail well, they, they were, it was coming to people who realized that fentanyl offered them, you know, lottery sized profits. You know, they, this is their lottery ticket. Oh my God. The problem is they needed to know how to mix it because fentanyl is so potent, the equivalent of only a few grains of salt mm -hmm. will get you high, a couple more will kill you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you cannot sell on the street a few little tiny grains of salt you have to mix it so that you can actually sell it as a product the problem is that the people that were buying this stuff didn't have a clue how to mix the stuff mm -hmm. and then on top of that not only did they not know but the myth spread early on that the best way particularly in the states that were first got these drugs like that were most hard hit by the opioid epidemic initially, Ohio, West Virginia, Kentucky, Indiana, places like that. You would find this a lot in those states. Um, at uh, the, the myth spread that, that the best way to mix your fentanyl with some, some other inert powder, cheap whatever powder, was with a magic bullet blender, the kind that you see in Target for $29.95 and on infomercials. Now, let me say this, that's a fantastic product. I own one and it's a magnificent product for, for small scale salsa or smoothies or whatever. And that's how we use it in my house. It is a uniformly awful uh, uh, machine for mixing fentanyl because it mixes with a blade. It mixes liquids very well, but not powders. Powders don't mix at all. And so what began to happen was people believing this was a good way to mix, believing that with the little plastic bubble, they would avoid breathing the fumes. Mm -hmm. All of that convinced so many people and narcotics agents would find at these different houses and apartments, they'd find this, this magic bullet blender in many, many places. They would, but they would, but one of the effects of that was to have a bad mix. So you began to see early on in fentanyl's life in the United States, 2014, 15, 16, you remember mass overdoses in like a certain, like 70 overdoses in Cincinnati, Huntington, West Virginia, 50, I think it was, I can't remember, but that was largely because the mix was so bad and 
And the, the, the problem was that the people who were thinking that fentanyl was their next meal ticket didn't have a clue how to actually mix powders well. And so they began to sell this stuff that some of it had no fentanyl in it. Others had a catastrophic amount of fentanyl. And you began to see those early overdoses. And that's largely due to the bad mixing and to some degree to the magic bullet blender used to mix the stuff. Yeah. And, and, and um, uh, the 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 the. Fentanyl is measured in what's called uh, MCG micrograms rather than milligrams. So a milligram is a thousandth of a gram. Fentanyl is measured in millionths of a gram. In, 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 in medical use, uh, the difference uh, between a, a therapeutic dose and a fatal dose is invisible. You can't see it. Right, exactly. The idea that this drug is being mixed by magic bullets you know, and, and people on the street just selling it is crazy. What, what we do, uh, the harm reduction people in Vermont, what we advise uh, people who are currently using uh, opioids and, and injecting opioids, we advise them to um, use a fentanyl detection uh, strip in, in each dose, not each bag, because even in a little bag, the difference between one corner and the other corner can, can, be, can be fatal because of Yes, um, the way it was mixed. <clears throat> I would say, though, that you got to be careful on the fentanyl st test strips, though, because now that people are out there addicted to fentanyl. Now, if you are if you are using cocaine and, you know, on the streets now, it's become uh, a, a pra common practice to use cocaine and mix it with fentanyl because it'll boost your cocaine, but also because eventually if you do that enough, you will get in place of that cocaine, casual cocaine user, you will get a, an opioid addict who must buy from you every day. So dealers who do this understand that there's a business reason for mixing cocaine into um, mixing fentanyl in, into cocaine. And this is happening again all across the country because the supply of fentanyl, of fentanyl is just massive. It can, it can be dumb. It's like salt. It's about as common in the drug world as, as salt. We put it on food and so on. Mm -hmm. But so when you get people addicted, frequently those test strips then serve another use. <clears throat> those test strips then become a way of making sure that you have fentanyl in what you're buying because mm -hmm. you're now addicted to fentanyl, nothing else will do. Mm -hmm. So you, you use the test strips, I've heard this. Now, anecdotally, don't know how common it is, but nevertheless, it makes total sense if you think about it, I would wanna test the drugs that I'm buying, because if I get anything that doesn't have fentanyl in it, I am not, I'm going to be in withdrawal. So you better have it. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's for someone who's not addicted to fentanyl, those strips can be a kind of a warning, like, don't do this. One, and one of the, one of the other things we're doing is we're trying to get uh, people who cocaine users to carry uh, naloxone because cocaine and methadrine do, like you say, have fentanyl sometimes in them. But imagine that, that's an amazing change, don't you think? I mean, think yeah, about it. Cocaine crazy. users now need to have naloxone. naloxone. And that is, again, all of this, again, I harp on it maybe too much, but, but all of this comes from this just idea that there's so much supply out there that now people are mixing it into cocaine or methamphetamine or whatever. One, one of the other things is there was a study done, one of these ethnographic studies, like a, an interview study with users, trying to get at what, what, why are we finding uh, so much of a concurrent use of methamphetamine and um, fentanyl? And yeah. a couple of the things they said was that um, they, they don't like fentanyl because it's much briefer. They don't like fentanyl because it was described as being more like a sedative with tranquilizing effects, whereas heroin is more like a dreamlike state, a euphoric state, with, with, but can also be energizing. So they don't like that tranquilizing sedative effect. So they're mixing uh, methamphetamine on purpose in with uh, fentanyl to counteract the sedative effects, which, I mean, when you, when you think of it, how can, how can it get, get much worse? So people are using two potentially fatal drugs at the same time. Well, yeah, and I mean, that, that gets to the other problem that we're facing, which is methamphetamine. Methamphetamine, in my reporting, 
is now more prevalent than ever because of new way, a new way of an, kind of an old way, but new to the trafficking world in Mexico of making it that allows them to make it in, in long story, but allows them to make it in just again, catastrophic supplies. So, so what we've seen is, it's an amazing idea. They have covered the country with methamphetamine. There's almost no region, there are a few regions that where it's not the case, but effectively covered the country with the methamphetamine and drop the price hmm. by almost 80 percent i'm in nashville tennessee you know and in nashville five years ago a pound of methamphetamine was nineteen thousand mm-hmm. dollars pound of methamphetamine in nashville today is three thousand dollars this kind of price drop has happened all across the country all those shake and bake those small time little uh meth cooks that you used to see about and read about and and so on. they don't exist anymore. They've been outcompeted. They're not in the market at all. It's it's a totally um, a market made up of methamphetamine coming out of Mexico entirely. Isn't the, remarkable the, remarkable yeah. change? And same time, the methamphetamine coming out of Mexico, in my reporting anyway, has found that it is accompanied by severe symptoms, very rapid onset, severe symptoms of schizophrenia. And then homelessness, and then I believe the tent encampments of today that we're seeing in many parts of the world, of the country, are really just a direct outgrowth of all the methamphetamine that has really marched across this country since about 2012, 13, so last nine, 10 years, and, is, and, and is gone to places where it never was before. Is this a result of uh, this, uh, the P2P? Is that, is that what that is? It makes a different type of methamphetamine. Um, yes. Right. And it's it's well, it's it, it it's unclear what exactly is causing it because there's no neuroscience on it yet. But there is it's clear that it's accompanied by this new way of making methamphetamine that is, as I said, a really an old way, but new to Mexico mm-hmm. allows them to make it in very high potency and again, in enormous supply like we have never seen. Uh, all across this, all across this country, hence the enormous supply, uh, uh, the enormous price drops we're seeing all across uh, 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 the the country. And and P2P meth came about because the Mexican government, you remember, I spoke of ephedrine, this one that, that this one guy was supposed to make in that lab. Well, ephedrine was the way they made meth for many years then the government in mexico put controls on ephedrine controlled the importation made sure only a few companies could possess it pharma companies could possess it and the the trafficking world switched to this other method Mm -hmm. this other method is actually very inefficient it's not a really great method for making meth but it does involve one benefit and that is you can make the crucial precursor which is a chemical called as you say p2p phenol 2 propanone you can make that precursor in with all kinds of different chemical combinations. It's almost unlimited, but certainly there are many. And, and, and so that allowed them to make a whole lot of it. And a lot of these chemical precursors, uh, chemicals that go into it are industrial, very widely available, very common and very toxic and legal as well. And so you began to see them doing that and, and enormous supplies just began to flood the areas just incredible. And, and, and they began almost giving it away too. I mean, I remember talking with people who are drug dealers, you get these guys, these deals like, man, sure, I'll buy some damn, it's like almost free. Then along the way, though, what we have been seeing in region after region, as this meth has marched across the country, is this very florid hallucinations, paranoia, immediate paranoia, psychosis, meth-induced psychosis that looks every bit like schizophrenia, but isn't, but Mm -hmm. nevertheless lasts, right? And so you've got all the, and and then along with that homelessness, because people cannot, they don't want to follow rules, nobody can live with them. I mean, there's all kinds of reasons why people end up homeless. Once you're homeless, using meth on the street, it's like almost free again on the street. It it makes it very difficult for you to get back into the real world once you're using meth on the street. And you're seeing this in LA, San Francisco, in the West Coast, all over the West Coast. You're also seeing it where housing costs are very high, but you're also seeing it in rural areas, Appalachian areas, Rust Belt areas, where there is no high cost of housing. I believe that one of the major drivers if not the major driver, certainly one of the major drivers 
of homelessness in America, tent encampments in America, is the methamphetamine that's been coming out of Mexico since, as I say, about 12, 2012, 13, 14, right on there. We're seeing it. Uh, we're seeing it more and more in Vermont. Northeast was uh, kind of behind the curve, thank God, for many years when it came to methamphetamine. But we are seeing it more and more in Vermont. And I think you you make a point in the book uh, as far as um, historically there have been waves, successive waves, opioids and then methamphetamine. Now we're having uh, or opioids and then cocaine historically one will transcend and the other will fade and then the pattern will repeat itself. But right now we're having simultaneous uh, waves of opioids and, and, uh, and stimulants. It's uh, unprecedented. Thank you so much uh, for your work, uh, uh, Sam. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Ed. Now, we, we, in, in all of this, so it, we have like a you know, it's like a like a, a quadruple wave of uh, uncontrollable uh, drug supply. Um, we have uh, prescription drugs and heroin kind of decreasing in death toll, while we have fentanyl practically on a like a vertical escalation, and now methamphetamine joining it in a vertical escalation of death. You know, it's pretty pretty bleak. Um, one of the one of the things that I love so much about uh, the least of us is that it is it is a hopeful book that that you manage to focus on the resilience of America, the resilience of communities, and I think most importantly, the resilience of of people with addiction. So I'd like to I'd like to just read a a quote from this section of your book, and then we'll go into that. <clears throat> So you say Jason Merrick imagined now what he calls recovery ready communities, towns geared toward help towns, towns geared toward helping people with addiction to recover. And then you say, he said, this is what rehabilitation looks like. It's full of a continuum of care, not just punishment. Well, thanks very much, Ed. I appreciate you asking about that because frequently when I'm uh, on interviews, people ask only about the drugs. And uh, uh, I don't believe that's the most important part of The Least of Us. I believe, in fact, the heart and soul of the book is really my attempt to tell stories from around the country about, um, about you know, pe Americans involved in the small, unnoticed, unsexy, work of community repair. And I focused on getting those stories because as I wrote Dreamland and as I prepared to write this book, I began to realize that I realized that, that one of the things that got us in the opioid epidemic was we wanted big magic answers to all our, all our problems. We had stripped ourselves, we had shredded community all across the country for year, decades, many, many ways. And we would go on quite a long time about how we did that and why. Um, and, you know, that was a devastating thing to do, because when you think of it, think about our brains, our brains evolved to not think the community is a good thing, but to think of it as an essential thing. That's reason why we survived as a species mm -hmm. is because we hung together through thick and thin, you know, even though we don't like each other, et cetera, all these things. There was never a time in the in the history of the world when people in isolation didn't die quicker. Today, mm. caveman times, all the people die when they're alone much more easily. And so oh <clears throat> we have understood that, I think, throughout the millennia that we've been on this earth. But in the last 40 years in America, we kind of turned our back on that idea and decided, wait, we don't, we don't need it. It's messy. I don't like them. They don't vote like I do. They believe in another religion. They're different race, whatever, all the different reasons why we don't want to be around other, other, other people. I began to think that, that combination of like shredding community together with this big idea of we always want magic answers, easy answers to very complicated problems was what I had to address, or I wanted to, at the very least, I wanted to find stories of the opposite of all that, mm -hmm. of people working towards finding community, uh, repairing community 
in the smallest little way, nothing that's saving the world. They're not interested in saving yeah. the world in some virtuous way. What they're doing is trying to say it makes a difference to work in this one place, in this one block, daily showing up. And that really became the heart and soul of the book. What is our defense from this, these fanged drugs, as I say? What is our defense from all this stuff that's legally marketed to us? It's equally just extraordinarily addicted. My belief is repairing community, coming together in small ways, getting out of the house, Mm -hmm. right finding people with whom we can work and and then doing it showing up every day there's no magic answer there's no silver bullet to all this stuff it simply is about that and so it were those stories so i i'll just mention one and yeah, yeah. go ahead in, in particular and i uh real quick and that is the story of a guy named bird who lived in the southern uh a, a south a, a neighborhood in south muncie indiana an area that had survived on based on these enormous factories making transmissions. Those factories began to decline, classic rust belt, they began to lose jobs, lose jobs over many years. Finally, the city decides we cannot have, we do not have budget to keep open the community centers in each of the major neighborhoods of our city. One of them they were gonna close was right across the street from this guy who was known as Bird. He had in fact worked at this community center for a while. So the city leaders, in fact, close the thing, shut down the thing, no budget, et cetera. And they think that's it, except for that bird keeps the key, right? He keeps the key and every day he opens it for the kids to play, you know, in and the, the older folks play cards. There's a wedding reception. He opens it for them, a birthday, you know, he becomes a community center unto himself. So just a profound profound story that I just it just caught me. Uh, and, and, and it was that kind of idea. And he allows that neighborhood, very small neighborhood, to weather not just the economic devastation, but then also the opioid problem as well. It becomes a, 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 an, a, a, a lighthouse in the storm in a sense. This community center, he fixes the toilet, he replaces the light bulb, he mows the lawn, he ha keeps that thing going for several years when, when that neighborhood most needed it. And one of one of the, I mean, I read about Bird, and and I was I was moved by Bird and a couple of other of your examples. But one of the things about Bird that that struck me was that not only did he do that, but he did it in spite of of significant, you know, personal uh, limitations. Yeah, he, he saw beyond himself. Right, he saw the good that he could do in the community beyond his significant uh, limitations. It was beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, his limitations were that he was psychologically incapable of leaving. Mm -hmm. And you know, he never, in a car town, he never drove. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's an amazing story of a guy. And he had died by the time I, I, I got to know his story. And later but, on, he had, he also like had medical, medical, he had met some medical problems too. He developed cancer. Oh, hor I mean, he ate horribly. He drank way too much soda, never went to see a doctor, never got in a car, never went beyond certain intersections. Mm. He just was kind of like the guy who was always there, who hung things to get hung things together for that mm -hmm. neighborhood, in spite of these very significant psychological issues that he that he that he had. But he did so in these certain years that were crucial. After they closed the thing for several years, they reopened it. Now, now mm -hmm. it's functioning again, and he's he died a few years back. But his he was like this bridge to keep the neighborhood kind of together until it got to a point where it could kind of function a little bit better on its own. It was a beautiful, beautiful story, but exactly the kind of story that I wanted to tell, not because I have any answer for your county or any other county in America. I don't live in those counties. I'm just trying to say, this is how we might approach things. I'm not trying to say, I know what you should do. Mm -hmm. I'm mm -hmm. just trying to say this, maybe give this some thought. The idea that maybe you know, small scale ways, getting outside, getting to know more people, because there are no solutions in isolation. Everything looks insurmountable and we can't do anything about it. The solutions come through the synergy and innovation that come from being a community again. And we have done so much to destroy that's, you know, that to destroy that. That's that's where the um, the title of the book came from. I'm not a Christian, but I was reading 
the Gospels, kind of almost looking for a way to direct the book. Early on, I read the Gospel of Matthew. I'd read it before, but I read it again, and it struck me again. That which you do for the least of my brethren, you do for me. Well, it seemed to me that Jesus understood, speaking to his disciples, understood the enormous essential power, the most powerful force that we have is more powerful than any drug, is this desire, the need, essential need to come together. The problem is in this country, we've done so much to shred that, to isolate ourselves. You know, that is, that to me, and, and I'm, I'm sure to all my viewers, is, is so beautiful, Sam, and so essential that, that out of this darkness, will be the friction to cause that little light that'll help us to move as a culture to move forward. And, and this is a great time to introduce Daniel Franklin because there is something going on uh, in, in, in communities all over America, but it is so evident in the Lamoille Valley and some of the work that Daniel uh, Franklin and his, his wonderful team are, are taking on. Daniel, do you want to Join us at this point and, and, and let us know about that little miracle occurring in the Lamoille Valley. Thank you, Ed. And, uh, it's so great to see you, Sam. Um, <clears throat> as discussed today, Sam's work is a timely and important is timely and important and reinforces something I've come to believe and observe and work toward in my career that we can and must build recovery ready communities, recovery friendly communities, recovery oriented communities. As Sam wrote in The Least of Us, in a time when drug traffickers act like corporations and corporations like traffickers, our best defense, perhaps our only defense, lies in bolstering community. And when I say recovery in my everyday work, I use the word recovery to mean recovery from addictions, from substance use disorders, from substance use. But what I truly believe is that what fosters recovery from addictions, namely connection and community, actually fosters recovery and healing and hope in addressing what ails us as individual humans and as a society as a whole connection and community, not as abstract or shapeless ideas, but as a concrete set of supports and actions and systems and relationships are the answer to many of the, the nexus issues that we have, such as addictions, mental health conditions, ACEs, domestic and sexual violence, poverty and hunger and homelessness, and so much more. With support from Jenna's Promise and North Central Vermont Recovery Center and others, Recovery Vermont is proud to announce that we'll be holding a recovery leadership conference on April 4th. This conference's theme is It Takes a Village, New Approaches to Vermont's Addiction Epidemic. It's an all-day event and will be held in person for more than 100 guests at Jenna's house in Johnson using the state-of-the-art audio visual system at Jenna's house. The event will be simulcast via Zoom webinar for any and all who would like to join us for the special day. Our opening plenary speaker will be Vermont State Senator and candidate for the U.S. House of Representatives, Keisha Ram Hinsdale. Our uh, keynote speaker will be none other than uh, Johan Hari, um, who wrote Chasing the Scream and uh, Lost Connections. And then finally, we're gonna, we're really excited to have Sam back to Vermont um, to talk about The Least of Us uh, and to share what he's learned uh, in his decades of, uh, of work and traveling around the country and around the world, uh, and in particular about hope in the time of fentanyl and meth. So we're really excited to have Sam back and to have these, these speakers and to share this recovery village with you. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Daniel, and congratulations on your work in the Lamoille uh, Valley. Jason Merrick uh, would be proud. So Sam, I know that you have to scoot. Um, let, let's have just a few final words. Um, well, I would just say I'm looking, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to this event um uh on uh, on april 4th uh and, and johnson i'm um, looking forward to get back to vermont i've been there as daniel said a while uh, i would say one thing that, that that daniel hit upon that i think is absolutely crucial and that is once people find common ground 
to attack one thing, I think other attacking other parts of uh, other afflictions that may uh, affect a town or a, a neighborhood or a region or what have you, a county, uh, become easier, uh, become more kind of second nature and, and the, the connections are made. And to me, that's an essential part of what I was writing about and what I'm decided to, uh, to um, why well, I've written these two books uh, is, to, is to, to make that case that, that, that it's when we do that, we just haven't done it enough, you know? So anyway, I'm looking very much forward to getting up, up to Vermont in April. I'm um, looking forward to this whole event and I uh, hope to see you guys uh, there when I, when I arrive. Yes, you will. We can't thank you enough, Sam. Thank you so much. Thank you. My pleasure. Yeah. See y'all. Bye-bye.